Okay, so I really truly think we're going to finish Romans 14 today. <laughs> I really think we are. And um, I'm excited about it. But the, as I get started, Kathy cannot be on today, but she shared something with me that I wrote down because it pertains to Romans 14. And she had ordered a book. Um, where did I put it? She had ordered a book um, called Grace in Gray Areas from the Berean Bible Society. And last Thursday, when she got home, she actually, or Friday or something, it was in her mail. And so she started reading it. And it was kind of interesting that it said something in the beginning paragraph regarding Romans 14. And so she, she copied it and sent it to me. And I thought, well, I'm going to share that because, you know, we know that Romans 14 is talking about the weak and the strong brother or sister in Christ. So we're talking about brethren here. And so what this grace in gray areas, and um, I can't, she put in the email who wrote that book. Sadler is his last name. I don't remember the first name, but anyway. This is what it says in the first paragraph. An old saying goes, in essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity, which is love. Liberty in non-essentials and the love and grace that is to be shown in all things is the theme of Romans 14. So I thought it was interesting when Lisa used that phrase love and grace today in her sharing of her story and I had written that down love and grace and then just the whole already communication is talking about love and grace and that is basically the theme of Romans 14 and sometimes we can try to put you know more words to things just to maybe sound better, maybe sound like we have know better what we're talking about, but it's really summed up, love and grace. And when we deal with each other, uh, brethren in Christ, that's what it's about. It's about love and grace. And we've been, you know, extensively looking at Romans 14 for that very, that very thing. So today I'm going to read Romans 14. I'm going to read 15 to the verses 15 through the end of the chapter, but we're really going to start uh, breaking it down in 16, um, verse 16, but Romans 14, beginning in verse 15. And if you have your book with you and you want to open up um, to page 254, that's basically where we're going to be camping out starting there today. So Romans 14, beginning with verse 15. But if thy brother be grieved with thy meat, now walkest thou not charitably. Destroy not him with thy meat, for whom Christ died. That's important. We remember that little phrase, for whom Christ died. Verse 16. Let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things, what things? Righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. For he that in these things serveth Christ is acceptable to God and approved of men. Verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. For meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. Hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. Verse 23, and he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. For whatsoever is not of faith 
is sin. So as we kind of start breaking that down a little bit, um, verse 15, I started there for a, a reason. Um, when the word tells us that um, if thy brother be grieved with our meat, walkest thou not charitably, that means that we're not walking in love because charity, charity is love. So when we are doing things that grieve our brother, these would be non-essentials. Remember what I shared at the beginning, essentials in essentials, unity. We have to be unified with that. But in non-essentials, um, we just need to walk in love. We need Either way, we need to walk in love. And so when we do something that our brother is grieved at, eating meat, when he does not understand the sound doctrine of the word, enough yet in his journey to think that maybe it's wrong for him to eat the meat, then it's wrong for us to do that in his presence and cause him to be grieved or cause him to stumble. We need to walk in love in that situation. Ephesians 5 verses 1 and 2 say, be ye therefore followers of God as dear children and walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savor. So we have to, when it relates one to another, our main focus, there's two things, and we're going to break those down in a few minutes, but one of them is to love, to walk in love one towards another. And, um, you know, verse 16, let not then your good be evil spoken of. The first reason we should be guided by the conscience of the weaker brother, you know, my conscience may say it's quite all right for you to eat the meat, but his conscience might not be there yet. So the first reason I need to be guided by the conscience of the weaker brother is so that Christ can work in that weaker brother and that he is not destroyed. I don't want him to see something that I do and it weaken him further. My whole purpose is to walk in love. We're going to get to the scripture a little bit later. Verse 19, follow after the things which make for peace and that one may edify another. So we need to be walking in things that make peace. If I want to, you know, in the beginning of Romans 14, it talks about disputable, doubtful dispute, disputes. That's not walking in love, making for peace. Now, remember, in essentials, that sound doctrine, we have to be solid, and we're going to get to that in a minute. Not that it's, it's, you know, we know the word is not forbidding us to eat meat. We have liberty there, and that all things are pure. But we have to remember that we're not all in this same level. Lori has a grandson, she said, is seven months old today. I have a grandson who is a little over 18 months. They're in different places. My 18 month old grandson is running around like going crazy, you know, and um, hers is not doing that yet. We're all in different places spiritually speaking. And so if we need to remember, sometimes our weaker brethren are just crawling, or maybe they've just learned how to roll over. And if we can understand that and put real things uh, uh, applicable to our spiritual life, maybe we can understand how to love one another instead of judging one another. So that's very, very important. So if my weaker brother thinks that I should not eat meat and I eat meat in front of him, that's going to cause his mind to do a lot of different things. And first and foremost, he's probably going to do that whisper thing. Can you believe, look at so-and-so. I thought they were this and that, spiritually speaking, but did you see she ate that meat or she drank that wine or she did this or she did that. She watched that. She, you know, it's just your mind puts things together in the flesh that we as stronger, as we get stronger, remember, there's always going to be weaker 
and there's always going to be stronger. And we're somewhere always in that middle. And so we have to be mindful of that. We don't want to send our brethren whispering behind us saying, I can't believe she did that, or I can't believe he did that. It doesn't edify them. Uh, it actually destroys the work of Christ in them. And in verse 16, where it says, um, let not then your good be evil spoken of. Your good in this verse is your faith in what the Lord Jesus has told us through his word. In this case, it is the liberty that I have to eat the meat. This liberty or this good is then evil spoken of by the weaker brother. And that's kind of what we were talking about. Therefore, by, my, by me eating meat in front of my weaker brother, not only does the weaker brother sin and his weak conscience is defiled, but also my ability to do God's will is hindered through evil testimony. Because if I leave my brethren whispering behind my back, questioning what I may have done, spiritually speaking, then it's an evil testimony concerning my, my faith. I don't want that. So it can, and his conscience is defiled, therefore causing him possibly to become weaker. And I will say this in relation to that, depending on where you've been and, and what your background is, I can remember my brother. My oldest brother was kind of a big guy uh, growing up and, um, you know, big people have a tendency, and this was back in the day when men especially wore suits to church. You know, you were all suited up on Sunday because Sunday was for suits. Sunday, you dress as if you're meeting with the Lord. You know, it doesn't matter that you even go to bed and he's with you. So you're in your pajamas. You know, it doesn't really matter. But Sunday was your best. You were to dress your best. Well, it was difficult for my brother being a big guy to do that. And he was very devoted and dedicated. And he would, I, I can remember as, and he's six years older than me. So even as a little girl, I can remember him sitting on the very front row on the corner next to the aisle, the very front row every week. Well, he would wear clothes appropriately, you know, blue jeans and shirts, but that wasn't what you were supposed to do, right? As a church goer, you were to wear, you're, you're meeting with the king. You dress as though you're meeting with him. So comments were made about my brother's attire. Well, quite honestly, it wasn't my brother that was the weaker in that situation. It was those who considered themselves elders who spoke ill of my brother wearing a pair of blue jeans to the church because that wasn't your Sunday best. Remember the Lord's day, you wear your best on the Lord's day. Um, and so it damaged my brother, but actually he was the stronger in that situation. But we need to be careful that we don't flippantly do something or say something that will cause that brother or sister to say, oh my gosh, well, maybe they don't even want me to come here. Maybe they don't even want me to be a part of this because I don't look like they do. Well, I'm sorry, but none of us look the same. None of us look the same. We all look in the mirror. We're at different stages in our age. We're in different stages in our physical fitness. We're in different stages. We don't look the same. I have some cookie cutters somewhere in a box, I'm sure. Uh, that if I want to make a batch of cookies and I want them all to look the same, I'm going to get that cookie cutter and I'm going to stamp them out. God didn't do that with us. And he didn't do that, do that with us in our growth either. So we need to be careful that we don't defile the weaker's conscience. And sometimes, like in the case of my brother, we may be behaving as the weaker. Because the, those who were supposed to be elders, those who were supposed to be leaders in that case were behaving as though they were the weaker. Let us just walk in love. Lisa said earlier, 
she had to just love Sarah. Let me just love her. And that's what we have to do. Okay. So to put this in modern terms, maybe you don't participate in the Lord's Supper ordinance at church. Now, I was at a church where we did it, even when I was here before, the Church of Christ, we do the Lord's table every Sunday, communion every Sunday. And that was very, very important to me. So I didn't have a problem doing that. Now I understand doctrine in the word. So I don't have a problem not doing that because I know that we're not under that ordinance that it's we've just misinterpreted so much but say you're at a, a church and they do that um but maybe you don't do it on your own on a normal basis the lord's you know participate in the lord's supper at church because you know that that's not the lord's table that we are to observe the lord's table refers to fellowship with other saints over a meal however your refusal to take a sip of grape juice and eat a bite of cracker may cause the weaker brother to speak bad about you, like telling others that you must be living in sin as the reason for not participating in the communion of the Lord. Um, to keep this from happening, in that moment, take the Lord's Supper, take the cracker, take the grape juice. That's not the moment to bring sound doctrine to the situation. I was speaking at a ladies conference one weekend and it was for a Lutheran conference. And I had no idea that, and I've shared a little bit about that in, in the past, but had no idea at that time, I was ignorant to the way of certain people. You know, for us, it was, you were not. I mean, if you had alcohol, oh my goodness, that is like the major sin. Well, in the Lutheran church, not so much. So when they offer the Lord's table, it's wine fermented. It's not grape juice, it's wine. And I'm thinking, okay, this is different. But what did I do? I participated because that wasn't a moment for me to create a doubtful dispute, which that's what that would have been. It would not have furthered the uh, fellowship at all it would not have made for peace nor would it have, it have edified first of all it was wrong on it, it would have been totally misinterpreted on my part but if i had tried to impose that on them so in that particular situation you participate in the lord's supper so verse not verse 17 says for the kingdom of god is not meat uh, and drink, but righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. The meat there, it's not meat, it's not food and drink. That represents the physical, the flesh, meat. Food and drink is physical. But what is the kingdom of God? It's not physical, it's not something that we can, it's spiritual. That's why he says, but for the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 12, that all things are lawful for us. The reason for this, as we just um, described in verses 14 and 15, is that as Christians, we are under the system of faith and life, not the system of law and death. The meat and drink is a physical thing and it represents the system of law and death. We're not under that system. Therefore, we do not need to take a moral stand on what we can or cannot do because God has called us to operate in the higher spiritual realm. This means that the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, that physical realm, but it's righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost, that is the spiritual realm, the life and peace. Therefore, we should pursue the latter over the former, which we, which we do when we cater to the conscience of the weaker brother. All of this chapter, all of it is encompassing the weaker and the stronger because we need to understand how, where are we? How do we behave in that situation? And we have to always consider 
that there are weaker and there are stronger. So in some cases, we are the weaker. In some cases, we're not. We have to let Christ in us live through us in order to do that as we need to do it, that we're not offensive, that we don't cause our weaker brethren to go against their conscience, because if we do that, then we are actually causing them to sin. It's not going to, it's not a salvation issue. Remember, that's not going to cause anybody to go to hell. Nobody's losing their salvation here because we already have that. We're already secure in that. We're anchored in salvation. But as we grow in the sound doctrine, that's as that's how we become stronger uh, in the word of God. God's will is for all men to be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. When people are saved, they receive God's righteousness and they have peace with God. When they come into the knowledge of the truth, they have joy or as the word in 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 says, rejoice evermore. That's joy in the Holy Ghost over being forgiven of their sin, being seated with Christ in heavenly places and everything else that we have in Christ, um, including Christ living in us. That happens the moment we are saved. So we're not talking about somebody losing their salvation. Uh, these things are far more important than eating a steak. That's why Paul says, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. It's all about perspective. There's something I, I had told you guys that I had ordered a few things from that Berean Bible Society. And one of the things that I, I wanted that they had because I have Eric's Romans, but this is by C.R. Stam, and it is his Romans. And it's kind of written in exposit expositors um, where he has the scripture in there and then um, his explanation or whatever. But something he said concerning this really um, hit home with me. And I hope I wrote it down so I don't have to try to search for it. In that book. But anyway, um, it said, he says, where the welfare of your brother is concerned, he, Paul, says, do not value your food more than Christ valued his life. What a disgrace to God if the liberty in which you rejoice is evil spoken of because of some small pleasure in which you insist on indulging yourself. Remember when I said, remember the phrase in verse 15, for whom Christ died. And then let, the, let not then your good be evil spoken of. For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. That really kind of puts that in really good perspective. We can stand up in our self-righteousness and say, well, it's allowable because Paul says all things are lawful for me. But remember, we are supposed to pursue those things which make for peace and which will edify another. So I need to remember that me indulging in my small pleasure, whatever it is, if it causes my brother to stumble over a weaker conscience then i'm not valuing i'm valuing that small indulgence more than christ valued his life it's not worth it and that's what this whole chapter is about um so i so far this has been a, a valuable tool for me just to kind of compare things and I just really got, it, it came in on my birthday. So you can know that I didn't, I just kind of went to where we are just to kind of look at some things and see. And what a wonderful thing. You know, none of us knew where right division came from. For me, it came out of the blue. I thought, where has this been? You know, this is, as Eric will say, some cult or something. But then you realize it's been around 
since the inspiration of the scriptures, because we're told to rightly divide. And then when you get resources from people who are right dividers, and they're using the word of God, and not an opinion, not an assessment, they're using the word of God, and those pieces can come together. What a joy it is to have good resources. And Eric is a great resource, and I have found that this CR STEM, thanks to Lori, <laughs> he's a good resource as well. But anyway, that's where that came from. So we need to value the fact that Christ died for them over my small indulgence because I don't want to send my brethren whispering behind my back. I don't want my good to be evil spoken of. And what happens when that happens is pride. When you have somebody that wants to stand up in their righteousness, it is pride. And I'm sorry to say I've worn those boots many, many times, the boots of pride where I felt tall, you know, in what I knew, and then only to realize years later how weak I really was and still am. We're all, there's always weaker and they're always stronger, but we just learn as we read and believe God's word. And it's all about perspective. Now we have completed 13 chapters in the book of Romans. Paul said in Romans chapter one, he came to impart some spiritual gift. That spiritual gift is sound doctrine. So what we have had so far in the book of Romans is that. So we have had 13 chapters of sound doctrine. Um, and we should have recognized the perspective of being in Christ, what it means to allow Christ to live in us and recognize that the only things that are, are eternal are the things of God. Therefore, we should concentrate on these eternal things. What did it say right there in the scripture? Righteousness, peace, joy in the Holy Ghost. And then in for he that in those things, verse 18, for he that in these things serve, serveth Christ, he is acceptable to God. So when we serve Christ in righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost, we are acceptable unto God. We're not going to be causing our brother to stumble over a weaker conscience. We just won't do it. Why? Because we will be motivated by Christ in us for love and peace, as some mentioned earlier today. Love, peace, grace. So as such, the things of this world should have no attraction to us, which means that we, what we eat should be irrelevant to us in light of the things of God. Therefore, when we see that a weaker brother's participation in the things of God could be hindered by our participation, even when we know it's, it's okay, when he is going to be hindered by us participating in the things of this world, we should gladly give up the worldly things for the spiritual things. Gladly. Hey, I can do without that. So that what are we to seek after? What are we to pursue? Peace and those things which edify. So in uh, regarding verse 17, to note also that this verse shows a difference between heavenly places promised to us as a part of the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace and God's earthly kingdom that is a part of Israel's program. Since we have all spiritual blessings in heavenly places, the kingdom of God for us is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. That is heavenly places. That is the spiritual kingdom, not a physical anything, not on the earth. While in speaking about God's earthly kingdom, Jesus said in Luke 14, 15, blessed is he that shall eat bread in the kingdom of God. So that was just a little side note that Eric put there for us to, um, to, to harvest. I love this time of year because it is harvest. It is the time of harvest. And I can't think of any better place to harvest than the word of God. So I just love that analogy um, being applied to the word of God. 
So verse 18, for he that in these things, righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost, serveth Christ, he is acceptable to God. So presenting my body as a living sacrifice to God does not mean to refrain from sin as most Christians think. Now, the more sound doctrine we have in us, we're not to, what does the word tell us? Should we continue in sin so that grace can abound? God forbid, absolutely not. But in this context, it means Christ living in me. In the context of verse 17, the in Christ's life is when the things of God are built up in the inner man and shown to others. In this case, it means me not exercising my liberty to eat meat in front of my weaker brother. He can then see the fruit of the spirit and desire that, which would give me an opportunity to present sound doctrine to him. So not exercising my liberty in front of my weaker brother may get him out of the shackles of legalism so that he may be at liberty for Christ to live in him. You know, my nephew came and helped us unload um, a couple of trucks when we were moving. And my nephew is a bull in a china closet. I, I, they were unloading that truck so fast and I'm seeing, and I didn't have any place to put these things because they weren't going into a home that was ready for them. So they were having to be stacked and he's bringing in stuff. And it's like, I'm, I'm staying there with my mouth open because I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, slow, slow down a little bit. We're not in a race. We're not in a, you know, a marathon here to see who gets finished fastest. But as I've begun to unpack some things here, I've, I've had more breakage in this move than I've ever had. And we've moved a time or two in our life. We can be like that in the spirit realm. We can be that bull in a china closet as if we're running a race. And I know that later on, Paul is going to refer to his life as that race. He's finished. Um, but where we are, we're just one day at a time, one foot in front of the other at a time. We don't need to be that bull in a china closet to, but, you know, kind of bulk up ourselves and beat ourselves on the chest to show how good we are and how strong we are. We need to slow down a bit and realize that if we don't stack the boxes as they need to be stacked, when they get too high, when we get too high minded, we're going to fall. And I experienced two towers of boxes in my home that were stacked so tall. That is why I have the breakage that I have. So spiritually speaking, now they don't, were there special things in there to me? Absolutely there were. And those who've been to my home probably would know that. But ultimately, my nephew needed to feel like he was helping. My nephew needed to feel like he was a part of the family. My nephew, this is my nephew who my brother, his dad passed away when he was 18 years old. So it was more important that he feel like he was a part of helping than whatever got broken in those boxes. And thank God that during the time I was standing there going, I just went to Ronnie and I said, look, you need to slow down a little bit. Whatever you need to do to get him to slow down a little bit, let's get that to happen. But when I've unpacked things and unwrapped them and I see the breakage, I just, it's honestly, it's okay. It's okay because it was not worth to damage what was actually being built Spiritually speaking, let's not cause those boxes to fall over. Let's do things in love and understand what that means. So um, shackles of legalism. 
It's where I've lived most of my life, except the last three and a half years. Shackles of legalism, I am so happy to say, have been traded in for the liberty that we have in Christ. And I know you probably feel the same way. So Christianity seeks after the things of the flesh. And we see that in the church day in and day out. They think we should act like the world so that the world will be attracted to us. This has resulted in the world changing Christianity, not the other way around. You know, the word tells us that we have the mind of Christ. And the way that I increase that or grow that mind is not by saying, well, you know, Lord, I think this would be more attractive. This would draw people into you. No, I read and believe God's word. And I let the sound doctrine to be built up in my inner man that I am using the mind of Christ, just like my muscle. This muscle has to be exercised. It can be exercised every day in the world, but only in the word of God can it be exercised in Christ. Only in the word of God can I increase the strength of that muscle that I am using that muscle when I'm interacting with my brethren and without my brethren. We have to walk in love. Church attendance may go up. We may see numbers rise if we um, cater to the world, basically, but numbers do not help anyone when the church does not stand for truth. When we are called to be the pillar and ground of the truth, that's 1 Timothy 3.15, we are not supposed to be conformed to this world, but we are supposed to be transformed by the renewing of our mind to be like the mind of Christ. Also, Romans 12, 2, to not be conformed to the pattern of the world. Paul will later tell us to be wise unto that which is good and simple concerning evil. Therefore, being approved of men simply means that men will listen to what I have to say about God because they see Christ living in me. This means that I do not follow the lusts of the flesh or conform myself to the world. Rather, I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Reach the world for Christ by having Christ live through you. Love and grace. Seek after those things which make for peace. So, um, I'm going to share that last paragraph. This is not unlike parents with their children. If parents do not live by the rules they create, their children will not follow the rules. How many times have you seen that in your lifetime? How many times have you heard it? And how many times have you might have said it even? Do as I say, not as I do. Well, let me just be clear. That child will hear you all day long in this ear, and it'll go straight out that ear because they're going to do what you do. They're going to do what you do. So we want Christ in us, that to be what people see. So in, in the relationship of children, we, we have to not speak one thing and do another. We have to do what we say. Rather than do as I say, not as I do, we need to marry those two things together and say, I'm going to be a person who does what I say so that I can model that as Christ in me, not as in my flesh, period. So verse 19, let us therefore follow after the things which make for peace. Now here is where I wanted to get to a couple of weeks back. Um, let us follow therefore after things which make for peace and things wherewith one may edify. Where do we draw the line? So there is a line. I can't just go with the flow because I'm trying not to make waves. I can't just say you're doing the right thing because I'm trying not to make waves. There is a place that we have to draw the line with weaker believers. In other words, how do you know when to take a stand against the weaker believer and when to do what the weaker believer wants you to do? And these are the two things we've been saying them over and over that we are to follow. 
and that is things that make for peace and things wherewith one may edify another. Since you are edified by coming into the knowledge of the truth, remember the will of God, that everyone be saved and come into the knowledge of the truth. So since we are edified, when we come into the knowledge of the truth, the teaching of false doctrine must always be stopped. Always. That's why it's hard for us to just be okay with participating and going back into churchianity, that which is world-pleasing, flesh-pleasing, tickling of the ears, that kind of thing, because it's false doctrine. And when we go there, when we do that thing, we're standing up really supporting that. And we can't do that because that is not edifying. That's not building the weaker brother in doctrine, but in the world. Paul told Timothy to charge people to, and this is 1 Timothy 1.3, teach no other doctrine than sound doctrine for this dispensation. Hymenius and Alexander had made some, some shipwreck. Remember that? Concerning the faith. And Paul kicked them out of the church. Don't you think there was a line drawn in the sand there? We have that example in 1 Timothy 1, 19 through 20. He kicked them out of the church. A man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition. Reject. That's Titus 3.10. Thus, there is to be no tolerance for false doctrine being taught. Now, how do you do that? Do you stand up? in the middle of the assembly and say, oh, wait a minute. First of all, if you're a woman, you can't do that. Second of all, if you do that, they're gonna be you know, handcuffing you and taking you out of, the, out of the place. So you have to know how and when to do that, but you have to stand up for the truth of God's word because it is only the truth that can edify, build. If we build with false doctrine, we're going to have that tower of boxes come crashing down because we stack up our thoughts. We stack up our theology. We stack up how we think it should be. That's false doctrine. And the higher we stack that, I don't know about you, but when I came into rightly dividing the word, I had a pretty tall tower built up right here. And it wasn't the mind of Christ. It was the mind of Karen. It was the mind that said, well, this feels pretty good. This sounds pretty good. But what happened, just like those boxes, it came crashing down. And boy, am I so grateful that it did. So when it relates to other people, even our brethren, those which are participating in salvation, but yet chasing after the next best thing, the one thing that sounds like it's the missing piece. We have the missing piece right here. It's called rightly dividing the word. And when we start applying that missing piece by putting that sound doctrine in us, it can't help but come out of us. And when we use the mind of Christ, it can't help but come out in the form of love and grace if we're truly doing that. Now, I have been that bull in a china closet, and I try very hard now to just say, okay, I need to breathe. I got to take a breath here because Karen's fixing to come out of my mouth, and I don't want Karen to come out of my mouth in whatever situation. I want Christ to come out of my mouth. That's why we interact with one another in love. We don't want to make shipwreck, and we need to remember what was going on when Paul put Hymenaeus and Alexander out. It was false doctrine. And he says, a man that is a heretic after the first and second admonition, reject. What does that say? That's a pretty strong statement too. Really strong. You know, I, I have people in my life that I want to get this. I want to share it with them and I want them to get it and gra grab a hold of it and, you know, just really lather up with it but they're not 
going to do that I, by my persistence. When you've gone to them, you've gone to them again, and they're still like, you know, I, I'm done with all this. Step back. Just let Christ live through you. Love them. And prayerfully, someday, they'll come to you, knock, knock, knock. You remember when, because, you know, life has a way of humbliness. My life has definitely humbled me. <laughs> and what I thought was not real. It wasn't the truth. It was false. So after the first and second admonition, reject. But understand that that's where you make a stand. When somebody is teaching false doctrine, that's where you make a stand. Remember what um, grace and gray areas. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. In all things, charity. I love that. So when it comes to the conscience of the weaker brother regarding our liberty in Christ, we should follow after the things which make for peace. This is because it is the God of peace who bruises Satan under our feet when we are united in sound doctrine. In a way, you can sort of distract the weaker brother from trying to spread false doctrine when you go along with his conscience. You are then free as the stronger brother to focus on the things that bring edification to the weaker bro uh, brother so that they may come unto the knowledge of the truth and not be weak anymore. It's like, you know, sometimes Eric will use the gym as an example, going to the gym. And in a way, spiritually speaking, it is a gym that we have to remember that we're exercising, but we're exercising in a way that will bring edification to other brothers, other believers, other people that we can share the gospel, maybe even sometimes for the very first time. And if we go in with our shotgun ready to blast, it's not going to happen like that. It's just not. So as the stronger brother, focus on the things which will bring edification to the weaker so that they may be come unto the knowledge of the truth and not be weak anymore. The weaker brethren are more likely to listen to the sound doctrine later on because you were willing to go along with their conscience in practice. Remember what this chapter is talking about. It's talking about meat and drink. So in that situation, that's a non-essential. Don't go against your weaker brother's conscience. And if it's an essential, we need to find the way to share sound doctrine with that person. Paul mentions to Timothy that there were false teachers commanding to abstain from meats. That's in 1 Timothy 4. Um, and I think I wrote some things down I wanted to share in Timothy, but I'm, I'm not sure. Um, Paul told Timothy to put the brethren in remembrance that sound doctrine says that every creature of God is good and nothing is to be refused. That's 1 Timothy 4, 4 through 6. Therefore, the same issue of meats when brought before the whole church needs to be addressed because false doctrine must be kept out of the church. Why? Because Galatians 5, 9 says a little leaven, leaveneth the whole lump. You get a little bit of that leaven. You know, if you're a bread maker or you've ever made bread before, you know that, number one, it's going to cause the whole lump to rise. It's not just going to cause that little segment, but um, a little leaven, leaven at the whole lump. That little false doctrine will cause the whole to become corrupt, and we don't want that. However, when it comes to the actual practice of things from a weaker brother who simply has not grown, to the level of maturity to understand the sound doctrine in the situation. It is best to go along with the weaker brother to keep the peace. Remember, we seek after the things which make for peace uh, so that there will be an opportunity for edification later on. If we send our brethren whispering behind our back, we've closed the door really on that person 
really even wanting to listen to us when it comes to sound doctrine. We don't want to do that. So uh, in other words, the time for edification is not when the situation is in front of you. It's not when the Lord's table is passed to you in a, in a plate to take the, the grape juice. That's not when it is to stand up for it. The time for edification is either before the situation arises or in the moment that you absolutely can separate yourself with them and say, I need to talk to you about something. Let's sit and never make it just you. It's as, as Eric says in the front of these books, you, God, and a KJV. It's, you've got to use the mind of Christ, which is the word of God. So if you try to correct the weaker brother when the situation is in front of him, his flesh gets in the way of being edified. So yes, take a stand for sound doctrine. That's where that line is drawn in the sand, but do not do it to the weaker brother in the situation. In other words, you have to recognize when it is a time for peace and when it is a time for edification. And that, that's a fine line. And I promise you, as we grow, as we um, have more sound doctrine in us, we're going to recognize forever, I think, the times when we didn't exercise that properly. But thanks be to God for his grace. And thanks be to God for coming unto the knowledge of the truth. That means we're always, it's constant growth. It's a constant thing as long as we're in the word of God. So. Verses 20 through 21, for meat destroy not the work of God. All things indeed are pure, but it is evil for that man who eateth with offense. It is good neither to eat flesh, nor to drink wine, nor anything whereby thy brother stumbleth, or is offended, or is made weak. I love the example here that Eric uses because he uses a scripture out of 1 Corinthians 13. He says, when I was a child, this is 1 Corinthians 13, 11. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Before I was saved, before you and I were saved, we were in bondage, just like a child under that schoolmaster. We were a child in bondage under the elements of the world, Galatians 4, 3. But once we were saved, we were adopted as God's son, God's sons and daughters, which means that I'm no longer a child. If you'll remember, we've talked at length about Israel still being referred to as children because they refuse, honestly, they refuse the sacrifice of Christ for them. They still want to stand in their own righteousness. So they're still children. They haven't grown up. We are referred to as sons. That denotes maturity. I have two sons. They are 35 and 31. No, 32. 35 and 32. I don't refer to them as my children any longer because they're not my children. They will always be my sons. So if you can look at it in that relationship, we have been adopted. We are no longer that child, speaking as a child, understanding as a child. We are now men and women to put away those childish things, which are the elements of the world. That's how God looks at us as sons and daughters, not as children or We've already received the salvation through Christ. Once I was saved, I was adopted as God's son, which means I'm no longer a child. Therefore, God took away the law and gave me his spirit, Galatians 4, 5 through 7. Since I'm no longer a child, I should put away childish things. Childish things are the things of the flesh. In this context, the childish thing is to put away flaunting my liberty in front of the weaker brother. Now, that really makes a lot of sense to me. We can grow, actually become childish in pride and arrogance that 
we weaken or we damage. We don't recognize ourselves as the weaker brother in that sense. Here, we need to remember it's not about flesh. Meat and drink, that's about a fleshly realm, a physical realm. It's about righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. We need to let that take precedence over those liberties that we enjoy in the flesh. We enjoy many of those, but sometimes we aren't to enjoy them in front. Never are we to enjoy them in front of our weaker brethren. So I should use my spiritual maturity to understand that when it comes to the weaker brother, the issue is not what we can do. It's not what you and I can do because all things are lawful, remember? The issue is what will advance the work of God in my weaker brother. The mature believer will recognize that I should forego my liberty. Remember what it said in this Romans book here, where the welfare of your brother is concerned? Do not value your liberty. Don't value your liberty or your food more than you value Christ or than more than Christ valued his life. Christ died for that weaker brother, just like he died for you and for me. And so we need to not use our liberty to cause our brethren to stumble. It will cause and be a stumbling block to them that are weak. That's 1 Corinthians 8 through 9. You know, years ago, I, I had, you know, you go to these craft sales and they always have these little cutesy sayings painted on wood or whatever. I had bought one and I gave it to um, my mom. And it said something to the tone of um, stumbling blocks becoming stepping stones. And if we can think about that in relation to our liberty, you know, our liberty is not a stumbling block to us, but we don't need to let it be a stumbling block to our weaker brethren. It needs to be a stepping stone so that we have the opportunity to help edify, to grow that weaker brethren in the sound doctrine that is found in the word of God. And I, you know, I, I, like I said, I thank God for his grace. I thank God that I can just say, thank you, Lord. <laughs> because even in my ignorance, you know, the word says, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died for me. And um, that's a big deal here to understand that. Um, and so I wouldn't use my liberty to be a stumbling block, but to, to be a stepping stone to help edify the weaker brethren. So a, a child may have to go to bed at 9 p.m. because the parents recognize that he needs to get a good amount of sleep. This is a good example. Once that child becomes an adult, he can stay up as long as he wants to. You know, there have been nights, Iris has been with us for a week. And there have been nights where I'm like, okay, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to go to bed. She goes to bed probably around midnight or a little after. And um, I've hung with it some nights, but some nights I'm like, okay, I need to go to bed <laughs> because I recognize that I need to go to bed. So when we become an adult though, we can choose. I can be the night owl or I, and which I used to be two or three in the morning, but, or I can say, well, you know what? I probably ought to go to bed. So, but once we, when we're children, we're under that thumb of our parents to say, you got to go to bed at nine o'clock. So, but when we, he becomes an adult, he can stay up as long as he wants to. He should not say, I can stay up as late as I want to, therefore I won't go to bed. Rather, he may still choose to go to bed at nine o'clock because his maturity tells him that he needs to go to bed at that time in order to function well the next day. In other words, decision making when we become adults is based upon sound thinking rather than based upon the law similarly speaking before we were saved we were children god had to put us under the law once we were saved we became adults and so god blotted out the law colossians 2:14 as mature believers, we can see that God is working in the weak believer to make him stronger. 
And so the mature believer will decide not to eat the meat so that God's work with the weak believer can continue. That's exactly the example of when we were children, our parents said, you got to go to bed at a certain time. Well, when we get older, we may exercise the liberty that we have to say, I can stay up as late as I want to. But then I think we cross a threshold back into using our sound thinking to make the decision to go ahead and go to bed. As the stronger believer, we have to use the sound thinking with the weaker believer. The important matter is doing the work of God. We can exercise our liberty if we want to, but then we can be that stumbling block in our in the in the weaker believer's path. So we don't want to destroy the work of God to edify that believer and edify other believers that that believer has an influence over uh, and have the gospel believed by unbelievers. God's work is far more important than being able to eat meat. That's what this entire chapter is about, the weak and the strong, the weak and the strong. Remember who you are. Eric said early on in this lesson, in this chapter, remember your identity. Remember who you are. So verse 22, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. I'm going to tell you, I used to be one of those that would do a thing and then feel bad about it. I would do a thing and that guilt, you know, I said, I used to refer to guilt as a coat. And today I might get, in, you know, put that guilt coat on. Tomorrow I might throw it over the chair, but today I would put that guilt coat on and not understand the word of God and the sound doctrine of God. So I would, but in my walk of life or in my understanding, when I had the guilt coat on, I felt bad for something or felt guilty. I had lost my salvation. Well, I know better today. I know better that that's not going to happen. But what this scripture is saying, hast thou faith? Have it to thyself before God. Happy is he that condemneth not himself in that thing which he alloweth. This verse is not saying that we should not share the gospel with others because we are supposed to keep silent about our faith. Have faith to yourself. That's not what that's saying. The context shows that having faith means being, as verse 14 says, fully persuaded by the Lord Jesus via what? Sound doctrine found in his word, that we are at liberty to eat what we want to eat. In this case, expressing this faith may cause a weaker brother to stumble because the weaker brother's conscience tells him something different. Therefore, we should keep this sound doctrine to ourselves by not eating the meat as, uh, so as not to offend the weaker brother. So being damned, you know, it says, happy is he that condemneth not himself in the thing which he alloweth in this context does not mean the, the weaker brother nor you will lose your salvation if you eat a piece of meat, if you whatever, when your conscience tells him not to eat it. That damnation or that condemnation in that scripture, verse 22, is a condemnation that we Im impose on ourself. That guilt coat that I would, you know, find myself in was something I put on. I put it on. You know, I don't need to do that. You don't need to do that. Self-condemnation goes against the word of God. Uh, sound doctrine clears a lot of things up, but condemnation, when we are imposing it on ourselves, doesn't do anything but damage us. And he that doubteth is damned if he eat, because he eateth not of faith. And here is what we've heard a thousand times or more. For whatsoever is not of faith, is sin. In Romans 7 verses 14 through 24, we learned that if we try to serve God in the energies of our flesh, we condemn ourselves by saying, oh, wretched man that I am. Then in verse 25 of chapter 7 and in verse 8 of uh, verse 1 of chapter 8, we learned that Jesus Christ, our Lord, has delivered us from this self-condemnation if we have the mind of Christ 
to work in us to serve God rather than our fleshly mind. So every time I found myself just getting comfortable in that coat that had guilt all over it, it was in my fleshly mind that I was doing that. Similarly speaking, if a weaker brother thinks that this is, that it is a sin to eat meat and he eats meat, he has damned or con condemned himself. Now, remember, that's not to say he loses his salvation. That's what I used to think, that my salvation was with me today and not tomorrow. I had it now. I didn't have it then. That's not to say that we need to think we are going to hell or he thinks he is going to hell now, but he feels guilty for going against his own conscience. Why does he feel that way? Because he doesn't have the sound doctrine that includes the liberty that we have in Christ rooted within him. He doesn't know it. It's like that seven-month-old versus the 18-month-old. The seven-month-old is not walking. The 18-month-old is walking. It's, it's all relatable in that way. He feels guilty of, for going against his own conscience. He has also damned the edification process in his inner man from continuing since he is now walking by sight instead of by faith. Because the word says whatsoever is not of faith is sin. What this means is that the weaker brother sins by doing the thing that he thinks is sin, even though he did not break one of God's commands. The whole thing in a nutshell, if we cracked the, the nut of Romans 14 open, is to remember that, well, let me just put it this way. Romans 14 presents a strong plea for grace and understanding among believers in matters of conduct not specifically dealt with in the word of God. When we read the first scripture in Romans 14, him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful dispensation or disputations. Uh, the word receive right there is not, you know, I might receive something in the mail. It's, it's not just me getting something receiving something that word receive does not merely mean to accept or admit into the assembly remember we're talking about saved people both weak and strong all saved so the whole thing in this chapter the the brother who is weak in the faith is doubtless already a member of the assembly it's not up to you to judge that it's not up to me to judge that Remember, we have to seek for things that make peace. And we have to also seek for things that bring edification. That's what we are to do. So to receive is actually a word that means to embrace. So I can receive, I receive bills in the mail all the time. You think I embrace them? No, not really. I have to pay them, but I'm not loving them. I'm not, you know, embracing that. To receive him who is weak means to embrace him and let everything that we do be done in love and to understand the difference between where we are. But the, the line in the sand is about doctrine. And when Paul gave us that example and Eric brought it forth, that's where the line in the sand is drawn, is sound doctrine. You know, you and I are ambassadors for Christ. We are ministers of reconciliation. And Eric uses a term here called soul builder. As a soul builder, I like that. A soul builder. I know that I can eat meat. The weaker brother sees me eat meat. Therefore, he eats meat goes against his own conscience, which hurts that soul building process. Why? Because he didn't do so in faith and whatever whatsoever is not of faith is sin. So if I do that, I'm hurting that soul building process within him because he has gone beyond what he can do in faith. Therefore, the only soul building I can do with him is in other sound doctrine 
lest he injure his conscience and be worse off than before. When his soul is ready later, you know, Logan is going to be ready to walk very soon. He's going to be ready to stand up. And then before you know it, he's going to let go of the couch or the table or whatever, the hands. He's going to be standing on his own. You're training him. You're building him. That's what we do as brothers and sisters in Christ. We build the soul so that what allows us to let go of that stability that keeps us, um, you know, standing is the sound doctrine that comes from the word of God. It's the mind of Christ. And before you know it, thank God for what that has caused in our life but be mindful of what it's doing in other people as well. Soul building is done through sound doctrine. Christ in you, living it out, walking it out. So when his soul is ready later on to let go of the, the couch, whatever's causing him stability, I can show him sound doctrine for today regarding the meat that he felt guilty about eating. Burn the guilt coat. But until we get to that certain stage, we don't realize that it's not something I put on today and take off tomorrow. Burn, eventually we understand, I don't have to put that on every day based on my behavior, based on my performance. I don't have to do that. And that person, that weaker brother regarding meat and other sound doctrine, as the soul is built, he will be ready to, to move on, to let go. So, and that's just where Eric says, therefore, just like someone with a weak back should not do a hard back exercise, a weak brother should not go against his conscience unless he stops growing in faith. So that's the whole nutshell of Romans 14. And it's been a, a, a rich chapter to me because just when you break down the scripture and we understand we've stood in judgment of one another so many times over things that are non-essential. We need to remember for whom Christ died. And no liberty is worth damaging someone's conscience or sending them away from your presence whispering. That is allowing them to speak evil of your good. And you don't want to do that. So let us, Romans 14, 14, 13 says, let us not therefore judge one another anymore. For Paul to put this anymore there, there was a lot of that going on then. A lot of judging. I think there's a lot of that going on now too. But judge this rather, that no man put a stumbling block or an occasion to fall in his brother's way. Exercise your liberties with caution sometimes, being mindful of a weaker brother who may be in your presence. Seek for things that make peace and which edify. Be a soul builder in our relationship one to another. And I can say with complete conviction and honesty, Everyone here is a soul builder for me. And I thank you that the conversations that we share, the words that we exchange is always Christ in you. And uh, I just thank you for that. Father, we are closing today just to say thank you. Thank you, Father, for Romans 14. Thank you, Lord, that 
Father, we have these liberties in Christ. But thank you for bringing to our remembrance that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can learn and glean from your word sound doctrine in relation to how we treat one another. Father, help us make seek the things that make for peace and edify, build up each other. Father, we thank you that we are given this honor and this privilege. We thank you, Lord, that all things are lawful, but nothing is worth, worth damaging a weaker brother for. We thank you for your word, and we thank you, Lord, that we can continue to learn and grow and harvest each and every day of our lives. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. What page were you on?